Hi guys, welcome to Office Blokes React. I am Office Bloke Dave. I'm Office Bloke Mike. I'm Office Bloke Dan. Together we are the Office Blokes. Yep. Sun's out outside. Hey. Not, I've just drove back and it was raining. Really? Which is mind blowing because no, I'm about three miles here. away. Hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah. I know. Spring almost sprung. Mm. Nearly. Mid March. Yeah. It's getting there. It's getting there. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, this Green Beret went on a one man rampage. Did Where? you know? No, I didn't know that. What do you say? Green Beret or Green Beret? I mean, it's Green Beret, isn't it? But I, I, just, said, I just said Beret like a little French. I say yeah. Beret because that's how we pronounce it. I say Beret. Do you? Yeah. There used to be a pub next to us and it was called the Red Beret. Right. And okay. I've always called Beret. I've always called it Beret. I think in terms of military, it'd be Green Beret, mm. wouldn't it? But if a, a Frenchman was wearing the little hat, I'd say it was a Beret. But the, the, the pub near us is named after the military as well. It's called the Red Beret. Right. Right. Because that's what they wear over here in the Paris, isn't it? Yeah. Red Beret. That's right. Yeah. Don't want to get it wrong, they'll come for you. They'll mm. go on a one-man rampage and get the yeah, office well, It was bikes. you two that got it wrong. <laughs> no, 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 hold on, hold on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's Popo Medic, this. Yeah. We've not done Popo Medic for a little bit, no, so I can. let's get into it. This green beret, what is it? Green beret. Yeah, there you go. Uh, went on a one-man rampage, let's do it. Thursday, May 2nd, 1968. A special forces operator in the midst of the Vietnam War self-initiates an impossible rescue mission to save his comrades who were pinned down and surrounded. With nothing but a knife, the solo operator entered the jungle, neutralizing the enemy and walking out alive with 37 bullet holes in his body. Did we do an infographic? Did we do an infographics one on this? I think we may yeah. have. That's what I was yeah. just thinking. I mean, there's going to be lots of nutcases like this yeah. out there. But I think it's the same one that we did. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. find out. Or something like that. Yeah. yeah. One of the cartoon sort of like uh, versions. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We'll, we'll find out. Yeah. Was that his yeah. name? I think so. In 1952, 19-year-old Roy Benavides enlists... How is he 19? I know. That's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> when he was King John... King John Un. <laughs> King John Un look-alike. In the Army National Guard, having lost both his parents at a young age, followed by insistent bullying on his Hispanic and Yaqui Indian heritage. He was forced to drop out of school at the age of 15 to help support his family, and Benavidez manned up quicker than most. And after completing basic training, Benavidez was sent overseas to fight in the Korean War, an effort launched by then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower to repel the communist North Korean regime from overtaking South Korea. And Benavidez did just that. And after three years of bloodshed, leaving 40,000 Americans dead and another 100,000 wounded, Benavidez re-upped and went active duty as the Korean War came to an end. By 1959, he would attend and complete airborne school and be assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He wed and began planning out his life with his new bride, and it was a prosperous time in post-World War II America, following its economic expansion. They're the new Ford trucks for 60. But the world stage remained shaken. Cuba became the focus of world attention. Here and between the, the chaos in Southeast Asia and the Cuban <laughs> Missile Crisis, it became clear that war was soon to come. And by 1964, America entered the conflict in Southeast Asia, aka Vietnam. Benavidez made his first deployment to Vietnam in 1965 on a classified mission to embed himself as a local while working as an advisor for the Army of the Republic Vietnam Infantry Regiment with the goal of establishing intel on the North Vietnamese Army, otherwise known as the NVA. And while hiking through the dense jungle disguised as a guerrilla fighter, Benavidez stepped on a landmine. He came to at an Air Force Base hospital in the Philippines after a group of Marines discovered his body. He was then transferred stateside to Fort Sam Houston where doctors broke the news that he would never walk again. Wow. And in an effort to stay mm. in the army and fight, Roy Benavidez, against medical guidance, snuck out of his bed each night and crawled on the floor wall to wall for several hours completing several laps, slowly redeveloping the strength in his legs, often in tears from the pain. And six months later, with his wife by his side, 
Benavidez walked out of the hospital. He was initially assigned to light duty upon his return, but Benavidez's mindset became larger than life, and he wanted much more. He pushed his body to its mental and physical limits over a period of several months as he prepared for Special Forces selection. And after completing the grueling pipeline, Benavidez was assigned to fifth group as an 18 Bravo and was officially a Green Beret. He requested assignment to Detachment Bravo 56 under the control of the Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observation Group, returning to Vietnam in April of 1968. And upon arrival, only three years after his landmine incident, the North Vietnam Army took the fight directly to the Special Forces teams. And with violence at its peak, Benavidez narrowly escaped death after his close friend from selection, Sergeant First Class Leroy Wright, intervened, saving Benavidez's life. And by the following month, on May 2nd of 1968, Benavidez was attending church at the base when he overheard radio transmissions from Wright, who was out on a recon mission with a 12-man Special Forces team. The men were pinned down by more than a thousand NBA soldiers in fighting for their lives. Wow. It's incomprehensible. It? It's unbelievable. The bit that got me here is that he was told in 1965 he was never walk again. 1968, he's back in the, in the military fighting in, in bloody Vietnam. In special, special forces, forces as well. Forces. That's no what I'm less. saying. Yeah. That's what he called determination, aren't it? Oh, man. Hey, man. I wonder how many people get given that diagnosis and accept it mm. that could have potentially pushed through and really, like, really oh, pushed maybe. for a few years and mm. got back to some form of fitness this guy's made a sterner stuff isn't he you know he's got off a completely different mentality I suppose yeah. haven't he I guess yeah. to a lot of people yeah, even just to be in the army anyway and be in special forces yeah. you've got to be a special elite. type person it is yeah. this guy's the elite of the elite of the mm. elite yeah without a doubt mm. and if that guy's already saved him and now he's got the radio call to say mm. that that guy's in trouble mm. you can see why he's just single minded Go and get yeah, guys. There's 12 yeah. of them, there's a thousand of them surrounded us. <laughs> How about it? Right, I'm going. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> who'd say yes? Hold me beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, just got to go sort some stuff out down the road. A <laughs> thousand of them. Won't be long. Doesn't change the odds much, does uh, it? Wow. Three helicopters returned from the extraction zone, riddled with bullets, unable to safely land and rescue the injured. One Huey crew member, 19-year-old door gunner Michael Craig from Los Angeles, was shot multiple times during the rescue operation and succumbed to his wounds in the arms of Benavidez, furious. With no time to properly load out, Benavidez jumped on the last helicopter heading back to the extraction zone, armed with nothing but a knife and an IFAC. Pilot Larry McKibben bobbed and weaved his way through the extraction zone to evade enemy gunfire, but came to a conclusion that it'd be impossible to land. Benavidez convinced McKibben to get him just above the tree line, at which point Benavidez jumped out of the chopper, breaking his fall through the trees before colliding with the jungle floor. And as he made his way towards his fallen comrades, he was shot in the leg and realized in that moment he was completely surrounded. Jumped out without a parachute. It's real life Johnny Rambo, isn't it? Just a knife, no gun. Mm. He could actually beat up Chuck Norris, I think. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. I think he's just about could just about edge him. <laughs> chaos, he located Sergeant First Class Lloyd Musa, taking cover behind a tree, with obvious deformities and lacerations to and on his face. Benavidez provided morphine and dragged Musso into a better defensive position, pointing Musso's rifle in the direction of the enemy and ordering Musso to fire. Next, he located Specialist Brian O'Connor and made a run for him, taking another shot to the leg in the process, which only pissed him off, of what she described as going into autopilot. AKA human instinct, carefully curated into our DNA by centuries of death and violence. And not every man's blood shares the same story in the barbaric chain of human evolution. Benavidez carried the blood of the Yaqui, and with a knife in hand, he cut down his enemy. fought his way into the extraction zone and signaled in the rescue chopper. The walking wounded made it on board as Benavidez laid cover fire with a picked up AK-47. He then located his close friend, 
Sergeant First Class Leroy Wright, who laid unresponsive beneath the tree line. Benavidez rushed Wright to the chopper, but in doing so, Benavidez was shot in the stomach and struck by shrapnel from a nearby grenade. When he came to, Benavidez realized Wright was killed by the blast of the grenade. The chopper extracting the wounded had crashed, and pilot McKibben was killed on impact. But the five other men on board survived. Benavidez quickly extracted the men from the helicopter, administered another round of morphine, and in a last ditch effort, called in a danger close airstrike as F 100s thundered the floor with napalm. Another rescue helicopter arrived, and Benavidez carried the wounded on board. And as he made a run to retrieve O'Connor, an NVA soldier hit Benavidez over the head with his rifle and stabbed Benavidez with his bayonet. Benavidez shouted to O'Connor to shoot the man as the two went hand to hand, but O'Connor was too disoriented from the morphine to react. Benavidez removed his knife and stabbed the soldier, killing him. He then picked up O'Connor and ran to the chopper while killing three more NVA soldiers with another picked up AK. Once everyone was on board, Benavidez was the last to join. And to everyone's surprise, Benavidez also piled in three dead NVA soldiers, just in case they were carrying any useful information. As for Benavidez himself, the blood in his eyes dried his eyes shut. He couldn't speak due to a broken jaw, and his body was in hypovolemic shock. And by the time they returned to base, Benavidez was placed in a body bag. A friend and teammate approached and ID'd Benavidez as his close friend, Tango Mike Mike, begging doctors to save him. But the doctors conferred and suggested there was nothing that could be done. Until Roy Benavidez. Seems like he would have got up and done the surgery himself. <laughs> so it seems yeah. that's the only thing he's missing so far, isn't it? <laughs> it's right. If you're not going to do it, yeah, I'll, do, I'll it. do it myself. <laughs> what a job doing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, like it's, it's crazy. It's crazy that these people exist. I know, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, like I said, the mentality is completely different, isn't it? It's yeah. Just on a different level, yeah. completely. We really are just pure warrior, and yeah. like selfless. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that he's how many times was he shot, and then he was oh, stabbed, and his jaw really broken, shot. both legs stabbed, and shot in the stomach. I mean, just uh, I know. you know, the bravery of these guys is absolutely hit over the head, off the scale. I love how it said uh, he got shot in the leg again, which just pissed him off. Suggested <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing that could be done. Until Roy Benavidez summoned the strength to spit in the doctor's face. Master Sergeant Roy P. Benavides, United States Army retired for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. And his refusal to be stopped despite numerous severe wounds saved the lives of at least eight men. A nation grateful to you and to all your comrades living and dead awards you its highest symbol of gratitude. The Congressional Medal of Honor. Hello, 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 Leo. Now I'm running out of soul. Hello, hello. The Veterans Administration offers the addicted vet no rehabilitation or retraining. New York City treats 4,000 more with methyl, with 2,000 on waiting lists. But that leaves 35,000 addicted Vietnam veterans without treatment. I have uh, a number of friends who are not alive. Don't ever let him bring you down. I have uh, a couple of people who've never One returned from Vietnam in their heads. Say. They're crazy, they can't be around other people. You see them drop down into a crouch and fire an imaginary machine gun. The guy saves your life. Hello. And I wasn't able to save you. I feel good that I'm saying Kind of a final goodbye to a friend. All American.
Americans can agree that Vietnam veterans deserve recognition and appreciation for their sacrifices, and that is why the Vietnam Veterans Memorial stands here today. They were and called the baby killers and just everything under the sun. They were treated very, very poorly. You know, there's a saying among us veterans that it is those that have fought for it that life has a special flavor that the protector will never know. You have never lived till you almost die. And it is us veterans, especially the wounded, that pray for peace most of all because we have to suffer the wounds of war. Wow. Oh, what a guy. Yeah. It's incredible how, how sort of softly spoken he was there. You expect someone that, yeah, really, you know, big yeah, brash, bravo. don't you? And, but, yeah. Tight. Yeah. yeah. It's always the quiet ones you've got to watch for, though, <clears> isn't it? <throat> yeah. I think it should have been yeah, a Benavidez Day. That's no, incredible. That's, what an incredible story, <clears> that absolutely. is. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And absolutely no, I don't think, I don't think, the, pro the problem with, um, with veterans of war doesn't just lie in America as well, it's global. It you know, is. Where people, they don't, they don't seem to look after their own as much as they should. No. Yeah. You know, and that's uh, and it's something, it's, a, it's obviously highlighting the issue there with Vietnam vets. Yeah. But I know there's a lot of people in, in different countries that go through it as well. And it's, uh, it's something that definitely needs addressing on a global scale. I think that was an especially dark period in American history, though, yeah. one there. Oh, yeah. I think time. one of the problems with Vietnam was it wasn't like... I don't think it's like a war that was won in the end, was it? It's sort of like this sort of like, yeah, it I know what you gradually mean. came to an end, but it wasn't yeah. like a big victory parade and yeah. stuff like that. And yeah. I think that's where a big problem with the veterans was it what they weren't treated as heroes when they first came back, I don't think were It wasn't like a real war, was it? It's, it's like oh, a, yeah. uh, it wasn't as like a fair war, let's say. Yeah. There's a lot like you say, a lot of um, PTSD that's gone on since then. Yeah. And uh I think there was a lot of drug abuse as well though, wasn't there? That's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, there's there's just a lot a lot of moving parts to that and I think I don't know if the hippie movement was a response to it or if the hippie movement was a response to how square everyone was in the 50s yeah. I think it's of the time wasn't it it's coming off the back of World War 2 and then people were getting more money and you know just feeling a bit more yeah. liberated I suppose it's and then sort of like more drugs were coming onto the scene not just America sort of like all around the world I think yeah recreational lot, drugs lot, weren't they a lot of the care that's available today wasn't available then but it's available yeah. today yeah, well, so let's get it. Let's get them the care they need. Of course, know, absolutely. Across yeah. the board, for well, these guys are, just, you know, risking their lives, aren't they, for, yeah. for everyone in your country? Mm. So they're they're yeah. experimenting with loads of like you know therapy whilst microdosing mushrooms mm. and and things like that. They're even doing it in the UK. Yeah, there's quite a lot of like psychedelic with in in a uh, in a medical environment with a psychologist or a mm. therapist, and they're administering things like DMT and ketamine, yeah, and things like that. And you're yeah. essentially like it's intravenous on a drip and you're doing therapy whilst also breaking down yeah. sort of neural pathways and yeah. stuff. It's kind of, it's crazy that they're investigating that sort of stuff now that could help people yeah. like that quite mm. a lot. Yeah. It it's definitely needs science. to be looked after though. Yeah. Oh, of course, absolutely. Yeah. That's but what a great story. From, uh, from, yeah, from, incredible from, story. From, from it's emotional. Yeah, yeah, one man mission. Yeah. Like yeah. A, what a well made. So, yeah. Probably yeah. the best pro paramedic we've done. Yeah. I'd say. Yeah, really well put together that. Wow. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers, Cheers. guys.